silence in pajamas. All right, so we are back with another exciting episode of Silence in Pajamas. And today we're going to talk about the eight characteristics of living things. So what that means is, you know, way, way back in the day, we had to figure out, okay, how do we define what a living thing is? And what they, they as in, you know, scientists, came up with were these eight criteria. And if something can check off yes to all of this criteria, then it's considered a living thing. If it can't, then it's a non-living thing. So what we're going to start doing is kind of discussing that a little bit. And here we have my favorite living thing, Ripley. Hi. Yes, yes, you go bird. Yes, yes. We have Jason the birdies and squirrels. Also living things. Or Jack. Yes. Yes, you go bird. All right, so first thing, first criteria, like I said, there are eight, is that all living things are made out of cells. Now, they can be made out of many cells, like Ripley here. He is a multicellular organism. He is made of many, 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 many cells. Or they, they can be made out of one cell. They can be unicellular. <laughs> yes, good boy. Unicellular, like bacteria. Bacteria are these small organisms. Oh my goodness, okay, here. Are these small organisms that are made out of only one cell. They're only one cell big. So, but still, they have cells. Now, we have a whole chapter on cells, and we're going to get into the different parts of the cells in that chapter, so I'm not going to really discuss that right now. However, we are just going to leave it as all living things have to be made out of at least one cell. Next is that living things have to be able to reproduce in some way. They have to make more of themselves and that can be done in one of two ways. It can either be done through sexual reproduction, like animals and plants and all that. So we know exactly how sexual reproduction works. Um, there's a genetic exchange of material between two members of a species. So in Ripley's case, a mommy doggy and a, do and a daddy doggy came together and they exchanged genetic material. And now we have this little guy. Mwah. Or there's also what's called asexual reproduction. And what asexual reproduction is, no genetic exchange of material at all. So there's only one parent. And oftentimes that's what bacteria do. Some plants, fungi, and all that can do it as well. But what happens is, instead of exchanging and combining genetic material, essentially an organism just makes a clone of itself. And again, we have a whole video on asexual reproduction later on. But even bacteria. Bacteria can generally, I should say, do asexual reproduction, which means they just go through cell division, mitosis. So you have one bacteria, it gets bigger, and then it splits into two. Now you have two bacteria. Both of those bacteria split, and now you have four bacteria. They split, now you have eight bacteria. They split, now you have 16 bacteria cells. Uh, there are some cases I believe I've read about where actually bacteria can exchange genetic material, and that does lead to a form of sexual reproduction. We're not going to get into that right now. Genetic code. All living things have some sort of genetic code that has the instructions for making them, for making all their traits and expressing those traits. We call this DNA. Um, we also have RNA, which helps to express the information in our DNA. So what is DNA? We've heard that term before. We've probably seen it in movies, in Jurassic Park, get a little Mr. DNA model. But what it is, it's just a, a really, really big macromolecule that when read and processed in certain ways, makes proteins, and the proteins will express your traits. DNA said to put my nose right here. 
my DNA says to give me two arms. My DNA says to put those arms right here as opposed to one up here and one right here. So DNA essentially tells us how to build living things. It's the entire blueprint for it. And we get that from our parents and they got it from their parents and they got it from their parents. And one day we will pass it on to our children. So it's a continual passing of genetic information. Next, we have grow and develop. All living things have to either grow and or develop. What I mean by that is, case in point, bacteria, they don't really develop, but they do grow. So you start with a small new bacteria cell and then it gets bigger. Once it gets to a certain size, then it'll split. Sorry, I'm looking for a particular picture on my phone. But that doesn't mean that everything is going to be that way. Some things don't just grow and get bigger. Some things also... Some things also develop. You do not look the same way you did when you were a baby, when you were first born. First of all, you did grow. You were not this size when you were born. I was not this size when I was born. Otherwise, God help our mothers. But not only did we grow, we developed. So our organs start secreting different hormones that led to sexual development, you know, puberty. Um, bones fill out and fill our skin out. Most babies can't do that. So we continue to develop as we grow. Even my little boy Ripley. He was such a cute little turd. I mean, look at that. I know it's kind of hard to see. But he was itty bitty, and if you're wondering just exactly how itty bitty, a picture of him and me somewhere. Look how little he is. And now you saw how big he is now. And he definitely did grow and develop. His snout got longer, his fur got fluffier, his tail grew longer. So we see a lot of change. Uh, let's see. All right, next, all living things have to be able to obtain material and use that to create energy. Well, how do we obtain material? We eat. Yeah, we gain energy from eating food. When we eat food, we digest it. We absorb the nutrients, specifically glucose. The glucose gets sent to our cells, and our cells. The Within them is an organelle called the mitochondria, and that breaks apart the glucose in order to create energy to power every single cell in your body. And it's not just us. Every living thing needs to get materials in order to create energy. Plants don't eat. I mean, I know some people are going to be like, but Ms. Komar, what about things fly traps? Okay, yes, sometimes certain plants do supplement, but they also do what most plants do and that's photosynthesis. That's when plants take in water, carbon dioxide, activate a reaction using the power of sunlight and they actually create glucose from this process called photosynthesis. And then the glucose is sent to their mitochondria where it can now be used to create cellular energy. Even bacteria, they can actually absorb thing, materials in through their, uh, their cell membranes or they can in, essentially enclose it in a vesicle and suck it into itself. So even they, even little tiny single cell bacteria can take in nutrients. They can digest it using different um, organelles and break it apart to what they need it to be and they can use that to create energy to power their cells. Alright, let's see. Respond to the environment. So what that means is all living things have to be able to respond to a stimuli or sorry a stimulus. One stimulus, multiple stimuli. And that's kind of easy to see on some levels. If I was to continuously poke Ripley, let's see what happens. There we go. 
there, did we? Hey, look. I poked him. He responded. He looked up. He's looking at me like, what is going on? Yeah. And he's responding to me. I am providing an external stimuli. Stimulus. Sorry. One stimuli. No, one stimulus, multiple stimuli. So I'm providing an external stimulus, and he responded. You saw his head turn, and you see him blinking and looking at me. Good boy, Rip. So he responded. Now, what about plants? Can plants respond? Yes, they can. There are numerous occasions where people have done time-lapse photography and videos of plants to show like flowers how they will actually turn and follow the sunlight and there's cases of flowers that will close up at night and then spread their petals in the morning when the sun comes back out they are responding to that external stimuli of the sunlight and the rays of the sun hitting them uh, let's see so we've covered external, also internal stimulus. So an internal stimulus is one that occurs within the organism. It's not from something outside, like I'm clearly outside of Ripley and I was poking him. But when our glucose levels get low, we have a few different internal stimuli that will help us to say, hey, you need to get those glucose levels up. So we get hungry. That tells when we get hungry, it's an internal stimulus to say, hey, you need some food because you probably need some glucose in your system to give to your cells so that we can provide energy. Some people, like me, also get headaches when they get hungry. And that's just because it's due to low blood sugar, hypoglycemic headaches. So the blood sugar, the glucose levels in your blood drop it causes headaches in some people, and that's the sign that says, hey, I need to get some food in me because I need that glucose to raise my blood sugar level higher. So there's all different ways that that can occur. Um, shut up that. Let's see, homeostasis. Speaking about, a lot of our internal stimuli are because of something called homeostasis. Now, what our bodies do what our cells do is try to maintain an internal balance. If it goes too far in any direction, the entire system breaks down and we die. So homeostasis is maintaining that internal balance. It's very, very delicate. The average human body temperature is somewhere around, what, like 96, 97 degrees, give or take. If you drop too far below that, you get hypothermia and you die. If you go too high above that, you have a really intense fever. If it gets to a certain point and a certain height, then your proteins and DNA stop working, they start breaking down, and you die. So you want to maintain that internal balance. You want to stay around that ideal temperature. And our body does that naturally. Our body tries to keep us within that certain range. For instance, if we get too cold, then our body will naturally try to raise the body temp its temperature. So we shiver, and what the shivering does, it actually causes these micro movements, these micro spasms within the muscle, and those little tiny movements they require energy. So that means they're going to give off heat. So it helps to warm up your internal system. Um, a lot of times the blood vessels will also dilate. Dilate? I always forget which one it is. But your blood vessels will constrict. Sorry, I think they constrict in order to conserve body heat. So they're going to get smaller to try and keep the body heat internal to try and keep more of it as close to the inside as you can, as it can. Because as your blood flows, it also moves the heat around your body. Um, on the other hand, if we get hot, what happens? Well, oh man, it's so hot. It's summer right now, so you know, it actually is. But we're going to start to sweat. 
our body will naturally start to sweat all on its own. And what that is, is our body trying to cool us down using an evaporative effect. So we secrete these little bits of liquid onto our skin. And when it evaporates away, it actually draws heat with it, creating a cooling effect. Um, also, our blood vessels will dilate so they'll get wider. And that allows them to come closer to the surface of the skin to dissipate the heat off when the sweat evaporates. So these are ways that our body helps us to try to automatically, all on its own, maintain that internal temperature. And our body does this for a whole lot of different systems, for blood sugar levels, um, for the different hormones and everything, our pH, our water balance, our sodium intake and all that. These are all ways that our body naturally will try to maintain that homeostasis, that internal balance. All right, and last but not least, all living things have to be able to change over time. Now, what we mean by that, it's not the same thing as grow and develop. And someone's going to be like, Miss Kovar, you do change over time because you went from your itty bitty baby to your now. Yes, but we're not talking about that. We're saying as a species, as a group, species change over time. So we're not talking about individuals. We're talking about regular, or we're talking about essentially evolution. I got some examples of that right here. So, yeah, we have some turkey. This is from a type of shark. Notice how big it is. Not super big. A great white shark would, its teeth would be similar to this, a little bit longer. So maybe no more than twice as big as this. All right. Well, the ancestor of the great white shark was something called Carcharodon megalodon. That is the mech. Think about it as a great white shark that could take on a blue whale. This is a replica of a meg tooth. Now remember, we said a great white tooth is going to be no more than twice as large as this. You can see a huge difference. I mean, these guys, these megs, they were monsters. I could fit standing in one of their jaws. I know that because there is a replica full-size jaw at the National Aquarium in Baltimore. And yes, I could fit inside this jaw, standing up. So what happened is, over time, a lot of the larger prey items in the ocean likely decrease for one reason or another, whether it's because of temperatures or um, they were all getting eaten or who knows what. But with less large prey, the bigger sharks were not able to get enough food to maintain energy. So since they couldn't get enough food, oftentimes they would starve. This means that the smaller sharks the smaller megs, so maybe ones that were, you know, whose teeth were only this big, as opposed to this big, they be, were able to live longer, reproduce, have more offspring until the new size, the smaller size, became the new norm for that species. But there still wasn't enough large prey to, some, to allow the entire species to survive. So again, those who were born smaller, who had a genetic mutation, a change in their genetic code that allowed them to be smaller, they survived longer, had more babies, until that trait became the predominant size, and so on and so on and so on, until we are left with the modern day sharks. So we're not talking about, you know, change that occurs instantaneous. We're not even talking about change that occurs within a few years. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of even millions of years to get from this, this. And actually this change did take millions of years. Some smaller changes might only ch take a few hundred thousand. But for such a drastic change in size as this, it definitely took millions. But apart from that, 
Sharks really haven't changed that much. They've really only changed in size. And that's just a, um, a testament of how well adapted they are to their environment. They're super well adapted to it. That the only thing needed to make them more successful in the past 100 million years was to shrink them down. And that doesn't mean they're small. They're still quite large. I do not want to get in a fight with a great white shark, but they're sm much, much, much smaller than a megalodon was. All right, so that concludes this lesson on the eight characteristics of living things. I hope you found it informative and wonderful because, you know, it was done by your favorite science teacher. But until next time, you guys just stay awesome, stay amazing, and stay safe and healthy. Alright guys, you take care of yourself.